Okay, hi. Um, my name is, is Mark Lutter. I am the activism and government track lead. And so I would like to welcome the uh, Radical Exchange Local Groups uh, panel. And this is one of the most exciting things about this space because Radical Exchange didn't really get started um, until about eight months ago. And five, six months ago, nobody even thought about local groups. It wasn't on our radar. And then we just had people saying, hey, I want to start a local groups chapter. I want to start a chapter. I want to, I, I'm talking about these ideas with my friends. Let's, let's formalize it. And we've just had this massive outpouring of interest uh, among various community leaders in different areas, creating these spaces for discussion, creating these opportunities to really understand what it means to apply and to talk about the ideas of, of radical exchange. And I, I'm hoping that this panel can in part serve as a inspiration and a little bit of a map for people in the audience in what it means to start your own local groups. Uh, some of the panelists, for example, said, well, I'm not sure I'm qualified. I only started this two months ago. It's like, well, the other guy started it three months ago, so I think we're okay. Um, and, and so with that, I'd, I'd like to, to, to hand it over to the panelists and have a great discussion about uh, radical exchange, local groups, and what it means to participate on the community level. Thanks. Thanks so much. Uh, my name is Joshua Shane, as you can see above there. And uh, uh, what uh, Mark said is totally true. So um, I first read Radical Markets um, back in April when uh, Vitalik had a review of it on his site and was kind of noodling on it for quite a while. And then back in early November, I reached out to Glenn and said, hey, I think I want to start a chapter. And somewhere in like November 9th or 10th, I posted something on Meetup and I went away with my family for the weekend and came back and 45 people had signed up just over the weekend without any publicity. So it was clear that there was a thirst out there for people to find other ways to you know, solve the problems that they saw in front of them. And so uh, you know, the, way that I see, the way that I see radical exchange is really a call to action with new ideas, new lenses to solve problems. I've always been eager to solve uh, the problems of uh, inequality, but I've never been comfortable in the past with the mechanisms that were available to us. Centralized power, coercion, um, all of those things make me nervous, even though some of them can perhaps achieve some, uh, some more egalitarian outcomes. So having uh, a new way to look at this problem through market mechanisms and being able to uh, approach different ways to apply those in our community was very, very attractive to me. And the interesting thing about uh, the way this is all developed is um, I was the first one to start one of these in North America, and I think second in the world. But I have a history of being about five minutes ahead of the zeitgeist. And so as soon as we started this, I turned around and there was a wave of people who were all interested at the same time. And so I was lucky enough to share my experience uh, along the way with a number of folks. But everyone here on this panel are very early adopters and have their own opinions about how things have gotten started. So before we get into the meat of you know, our experience starting these up and what we find to be the best resources and how to engage the community, we're gonna go down and uh, have everyone introduce themselves and start the conversation from there. Uh, hi everyone, my name is Vladimir. I run local chapter in Moscow, Russia. And uh, so a little bit about, uh, about how I got acquainted with uh, radical markets ideas. So I used to work in blockchain field uh, in, uh, in a company which uh, did uh, aesthetic tokenization. And uh, then in September, there was a uh, radical li uh, liberal radicalism white paper written by uh, one of the authors was Vitalik. And, uh, you know, in blockchain field, if uh, Vitalik writes something, it's, uh, it, it's considered to be cool. So, uh, so I read this white paper and uh, uh, I really liked the idea. So we, and at that time, uh, we, me and uh, some other guys, we, uh, we made a blog. So we wanted to make, make a video about it. And uh, while making a video, uh, I got acquainted with uh, uh, several other ideas like uh, Tocqueville, wheel, meal, and uh, other economies, and I really liked the applications. And uh, uh, then in December, uh, so right now I work in an organization which called Alternativa, which fights against uh, modern slavery and human trafficking. Uh, and I thought that some ideas uh, described at uh, Uniting World Workers chapter uh, could might be implemented there. So uh, I discussed these ideas in, inside our team. Then uh, I wrote to Glenn and. Uh, 
After discussion, it turned out to be that uh, it will not work, but uh, then Glenn suggested to start a local chapter in Moscow. I think it was uh, late December, or January. And uh, what I actually did, so right now we have, uh, like in our chat, around uh, 60 people, and uh, uh, like I think the main results, uh, I pr presented uh, radical markets ideas at Crypto Economics Conference, and uh, like I think several hundred people uh, have watched the video after after it and uh, yeah so we also have a, a local chapter in Moscow Russia hi there I'm Marina Finley I'm a senior at Princeton and I along with Jack Henderson another senior at Princeton started the radical exchange student network um, we've spearheaded the growth of about a dozen student chapters of radical exchange across universities in North America and Europe um, and we got involved thanks to our professor, Glenn Weil, who taught a class this past fall at Princeton about radical markets. Um, and it was amazing for us in that it was a very different kind of curriculum than we'd ever experienced before. We had an interdisciplinary you know, curriculum instead of readings, but every day we would show up to class and students have had a lot of independence in how the three-hour class would be structured. Um, so there was a lot of kind of decentralized leadership in class discussion, in student projects, in independent work that we did throughout the class, and we became inspired to um, lead a broader movement, getting students involved in radical exchange. Um, and just kind of a, a quick observation on students as part of the heart of this movement. Um, there's a long and prolific history of student activism as a catalyst for social change, and we take a lot of inspiration from that whether it's the Woolworth lunch counter, lunch counter sit-ins that were ultimately critical in um, bringing about the 1964 Civil Rights Act, or even more recently, the 16-year-old Swede, Greta Thunberg, who has single-handedly inspired tens of thousands of students around the world to strike from school um, over political inaction on climate change. We are really inspired by this history of student activism as a powerful voice for change, and we want to bring that same energy, harness the power of youth um, to bring about a world in which we want to live. You know, a world of radical exchange where we have more prosperity, more equality, and more cooperation. Um, and so we're really focused on bringing young people into the movement. Wow. Uh, my name is Tom Ivey, and I lead the Detroit chapter here. And uh, I, got, I got started in radical exchange because I was running for Michigan House Rep um, about a year ago and I was really dissatisfied with the process, and uh, I kind of quit, and I said, this is very silly, and I'm going to go, just go learn to code and build something different. Um, I did not finish learning how to build uh, build ship products, but uh, I also read Vitalik's paper, noticed that, that uh, this conference is going to be hosted here in Detroit, and I reached out and I said, hey, do you want someone on the ground to help you like organize? Um, and it has been a wild ride since. I have met so many people and been involved in so many interesting discussions. I, I really, like, if you're interested in starting a chapter, I can't say uh, that you should not do it. To double negative. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I, wanna, I wanna move on to um, kind of the practical side of this, right? We, we, have all, we have these ideals about, you know, getting together and talking about this new way of approaching problems. But I think, you know, the rubber meets the road when we can have an impact. And so, um, you know, one of the ways that I talk to people about, um, you know, joining in and starting their own local chapter is the, in the context of what goals are and how we can achieve them. So, um, as I mentioned earlier, I see the radical exchange as a call to action. There's a new lens with which to solve problems. How do we go into our communities and how do we solve those problems? So, um, one of the things that I look at very closely is experimentation. What kinds of ways can we apply these radical exchange ideas locally within our communities, maybe even within our uh, local groups, um, to actually make sure that they work? Um, my interest is to you do this experimentation to achieve some sort of best practices repository where we can all say, hey, we use quadratic voting in this context and we found that it worked. Or we use quadratic voting in this context and the outcome was good in the sense that it really provided voice to minority views within a community, but it also had created some problems within social cohesion because people got upset with each other because of the way in which they were voting or the way that they were approaching the problem. So there are a lot of kind of meta issues, I think, with these new approaches to things that we want to be very sensitive to. And so that kind of experimentation is something that I'm very eager to pursue. 
For example, in Seattle, we're now talking to um, a, an activist group who is focused on um, trying to work with the city to ensure that as Comcast gets its n license for the next 10 years for it for the ability to run lines throughout the city that we get some sort of remuneration or some sort of consideration around the data as labor concept. Um, in Seattle, we also have something called democracy vouchers where you get a hundred dollars of democracy vouchers every year to give to various candidates. And we are talking with the city of Seattle about uh, adopting quadratic approaches to those democracy vouchers as well. So really trying to take these ideas find practical applications for them in a small local context so we can expand them once we, um, as a group of all of these uh, chapters all over the country and all over the world, have more and more information about what works and what doesn't. That said, you know, we're four months into this, right? The, v the first chapter in the North America essentially started in November, and here we are in March, and there's an amazing amount of uh, momentum and work that's b been done so far, but nevertheless, we're just beginning. So I'm interested to hear from, uh, from you guys what you think your next steps are, what you want to achieve in your organizations. Um, so definitely in the student network, experimentation has been critical too. Um, one thing that we've been thinking about is, you know, how do we use students, uh, because we're always kind of interacting with each other, um, we live amongst each other generally at universities and you know, take classes together with different kinds of students, so there is very much this opportunity to be interdisciplinary. How do we best um, get students involved with the network and then disseminate information to help build our networks? Um, so the first thing we try to do is recruit, spread information, get more students involved, um, educate, uh, learn about kind of key radical markets and radical exchange issues. And a lot of the experimentation that we've been focused on has been first and foremost on our campuses and then to whatever extent is possible in the broader community. So for example, whether that's using quadratic voting in our student government uh, elections and referenda or thinking about ways that we can apply um, cost type systems to student like information bulletins and um, things that students access in terms of media. Um, we've been working with that as well. Um, and I think to some extent, schools as a place where people are really pondering ideas and um, thinking about information and knowledge yields a lot of great research. Um, so in the class that Glenn taught and then even more so um, when we get students together and introduce them to these topics, and maybe this is just because students already do this, um, we kind of work together to brainstorm ideas. So a couple examples that we've found very successful in experimentation have been, um, for example, one student wrote a, kind of a research paper about um, how some of these radical exchange ideas could be popularized in China and posted that on the student website that we have. And then another student from Rochester saw it um, and that student is Chinese and um, emailed us and said, hi, I read this paper, I have these ideas, you know, I'm connected to social networks in China and I'd love to get this off the ground. Um, another example is um, some students uh, read the book uh, and then went to their friends who hadn't read the book and tried to practice explaining the ideas to them, um, figured out what methods that worked and then made infographics about these ideas to help kind of further disseminate across different means um, some of the kind of basic broad concepts of radical exchange. And so in this sense, we found having a lot of the work that we've already done be open and accessible to other students has been really helpful and making leadership and responsibility kind of self-organizing. So if you have something that you find interesting and you run want to run with it, um, by all means, go ahead and do it. And that has really helped have leadership bubble up naturally. Uh, yeah, so in the same way as Marina did, we started from uh, spreading the ideas. And actually the practice we found useful is that uh, to make uh, weekly calls in the end of the week. So for, I think for a couple of weeks, we, uh, we organized the calls. So there were several people who chose a topic they want to discuss and uh, read a specific chapter or white paper. And uh, then we just discussed, discussed these topics and uh, it was good to get a uh, better understanding of ideas. And as the next step, yeah, we, uh, we are going to uh, to make some experiments and uh, uh, application I'm particularly interested in a lot is uh, public goods funding, uh, which is described in liberal radicalism white paper. And because uh, you know, it's uh, actually there's a concept that all the investment is uh, in people. 
and uh, it's like uh, uh, actually it's like uh, for example when you when we built a new build some public object uh, in a neighborhood the cost of all the uh, all the house neighborhood rises and uh, like I don't know how exactly, but uh, I think some uh, similar mechanisms should be implemented in uh, investment in people. And uh, uh, again, I don't know how exactly would it run, but uh, yeah, I'm just interested to try uh, to implement radical market ideas in this field. Um, for my chapter, which is very unique, I am not representative of the city of Detroit. I uh, have the honor and like the joy of assisting um, my co-founder in, in my chapter, Ingrid LaFleur, who will be speaking on a separate panel, um, who is representative of her community and is an amazing community leader and engagement um, person. <laughs> um, so for me, my chapter focuses on research and outreach to determine what, uh, what are the things that we can do to serve existing communities. We interrogate uh, our leadership structure and we find out you know, how do we provision our resources to the people who need them the most. We're a little more cautious about running experiments because the nature of uh, newcomers in Detroit can be very political. Uh, so we are, we are very much slower moving. Uh, and we think that that yields kind of a more thoughtful approach. Um, but as a result, we aren't as uh, productive, I would say. Well, I mean, yes and no, right? So different environments require different kinds of approaches. And uh, I was struck by what Ms. Petty said earlier regarding language, where you know, within, within my environment in Seattle, we are trying to bring in people um, that have diverse backgrounds. Um, but it's very challenging to do that if you don't have a sensitivity to language, if you don't have a sensitivity to how these things can be communicated to different uh, audiences and to different people in the community who may be interested. So, um, you know, <laughs> as Tom said, we are just starting. Like, we are, we are just a two or three months in, and there's a lot of work that we can do within the uh, community of radical exchange chapters to help each other with that. One of the things that I think is going to be very important is for us to find a way to coordinate in a decentralized way. Each group is independent and autonomous, both from each other, but also from the Radical Exchange Foundation. But nevertheless, we want to be able to share our learnings, share our understandings, share our resources. So we're beginning to do that. We, ha we are starting to have um, uh, uh, online things for people to get access to. We have a, uh, we have a radical exchange forum where we probably have, I don't know, 50 or 60 uh, participants. We have a Slack channel as well, but that's really just kind of baby steps, baby steps, not even steps, crawling. We're gonna crawl, walk, run on this. So th there is an effort here that we really need to focus on that says, how do we communicate with our communities in an effective way so it's not just people like us sitting up here and uh, starting these chapters and, and engaging. So um, I'd be interested to hear from all of you like how you think you can uh, best approach that um, in your communities. It's certainly in the student community, it seems like you have more access in general to a wider variety of, uh, of folks right at your doorstep. So how do you look at that um, within the academic environment? Um, I think that's a great question. Language is definitely something we've been thinking a lot about from the very beginning and are still absolutely still you know, working on and have not perfected by any means. Um, one thing I think in the academic environment that's difficult is some people look at this and think, oh, this is you know, specifically for economics majors or to some extent politics and public policy majors and getting people who have more of an arts background um, has been more challenging and to some extent even um, traditional social activists view this as a little more wonky um, and you know, removed. So when we've been thinking about and trying to uh, branch into language, you know, even to people who aren't in university, so high school students, um, students who go to schools all over the world or study all different kinds of things, um, some of the language even it, that we have been throwing around in you know, the conference um, in terms of uh, ideas that come from radical markets or uh, more technical terms, figuring out ways to communicate that um, conceptually, the basic ideas and values and how people who could really stand to benefit from them the most um, can access these ideas conceptually. That's something that we're still trying to work out um, and is certainly still a struggle. One thing I would mention is I wanna plug um, tomorrow morning at breakfast, and Sunday as well, there's gonna be a mentorship meetup for students and faculty. Um, so if you're a student interested in starting a radical exchange chapter at your university, we'll be at breakfast, you can meet with faculty, chat, 
uh, develop kind of personal connections, and then even more so, we'll all be at breakfast tomorrow morning. We'll also be hanging out here after the panel today. So if you want to connect with us, get more concrete advice about how to start your own local chapter or talk to us over coffee tomorrow morning, we'll be at breakfast and happy to give any guidance we can on that. Um, but I think every community is different. Every community has its own strengths and opportunities for radical exchange ideas to really come in and benefit stakeholders in the community. So that's kind of the benefit of having it be decentralized, but it's certainly a challenge as well of how much you wanna balance um, local decentralized leadership and kind of guidance from um, people who have more experience. Yeah, th th that's a really interesting question, and, and we're, we'll come back to that I in a little bit, but I wanna hear from uh, both Tom and Vladimir about the audiences that they're trying to reach and you know what, they're f what techniques they're thinking about or, or how they're going to approach it. I think for us, um, it's a question of what do people need, what are they interested in? I can't show up at somebody's door and expect them to understand quadratic voting, particularly if they aren't uh, literate in the basic sense. I mean, digital uh, like literacy is very low in Detroit. Um, literacy is quite low in Detroit. So, so finding, uh, to use the words of Joe Edelman, like easier ins, um, I thought was very, uh, made, made a lot of sense to me. So instead, we think about some of the community needs. Right now, we're exploring uh, like an art benefit project uh, that would help relieve like local debt. Um, and again, moving very slowly on that because it's a very contentious subject. Um, so making it relatable and then breaking it down into the most understandable pieces. So we, we probably won't talk about quadratic voting. We will, that's like seventh grade and we're at first grade here. Um, so describing the voting process, how will they be able to access voting? Will they have to use transit? Will they be able to do this on their mobile phone? Do they have mobile phone access? We have to break down every step to see where do people fall off? So very, very systematically. Uh, as for spreading the radical markets ideas, I think the best, uh, uh, the, ma the most important thing which is uh, necessary to concentrate on is uh, show some real world cases like which are working. Because, uh, you know, it's like uh, with Gold Rush, when people see that they can uh, switch to something else and achieve more, so they will do it. And uh, I think it's uh, like, uh, it's better to concentrate uh, uh, on making some working cases. Like, uh, for example, with uh, quadratic voting uh, and uh, to show that, yeah, it works much better than uh, uh, than before. And uh, yeah, if, uh, if people see it, so it will be much easier to switch. Yeah, so I, I wanted to, to come back to the coordination question because one of the things that I think we're facing is that each of us are doing some great work, but because we are uh, kind of by, by definition supposed to be independent and autonomous, I think that one of the things that we have to focus on in the next few months is working collaboratively just as a, as a way to coordinate the work that we're doing, whether it is creating repositories for kind of best practices or agreeing upon kind of experimental design that we're going to use. Again, like the goal here is to have practical ways that we can approach problems within our communities, but we don't want that to be isolated in silos of information for each community. So. Um, one of the things that we're trying to do is using this forum as a center to do that, but it seems like there are some a lot of other things that we could be doing, um, whether it's you know having community calls or whether it is trying to do some recruiting together. Have any of you had any thoughts towards how we can share our, our information and how we can engage together? Do you want to start? Um, so Detroit is very small. My chapter actually probably has like a regular attendance of about 12 members. Uh, so we act more as like a support or an ancillary group to existing organizations like US Detroit um, or uh, the Detroit Blockchainers, groups that have maybe similar interests, also the Equitable Internet Initiative, which develops mesh nets. So some really cool things are happening here and finding those groups and, and kind of teaming up, I think is the best way for new things to start because you get to learn something new, you get immediate feedback on ideas and, uh, and, and you get kind of like a larger group of people to, to, to network with and, and then they bring in more. So just finding that, that initial momentum is key. I would add, um, in my experience on the student network, um, at Princeton we've teamed up with some programs on campus that already tap into some of the kind of research oriented ideas that Radical Exchange is focused on. Um, and then in terms of connecting with students from around the world who are interested in radical markets or different aspects of radical exchange, um, we've been able to plug into some already existing student organizations um, that have kind of infrastructure on the ground at their campus, but the students involved in that organization realize, you know, oh wait, we're really interested in these ideas too, and they parallel pretty well with, you know, what they're already working on, so that's always helpful. Um, 
And then in terms of kind of methodology for communication, I think that's hard and we're still struggling with how to scale that because every time we have students at a new university um, express interest, you know, we'll generally do like a phone call with them so we can actually have person to person communication and I think that's really helpful in terms of um, sharing efficiently with people. This is, you know, some of the things we found really successful. These are some recommendations that we think you could uh, take or, you know, pursue whatever you want to do. But um, I think when people are just looking at information on a website and not engaging directly with another person, sometimes it is hard to really set that spark of inspiration going. So that's something we definitely want to continue exploring, how to do that best. Um, and in terms of the forum and the Slack, kind of the same question, how, how do we connect people in a meaningful way that does help inspire them? Um, even if it's not, you know, a phone call for every new person you bring on or a conference to connect, you know, people every five months. So that's, that's certainly a challenge that I think we're, we're gonna have to try to figure out. And in the student group, it might be kind of regional networks. Um, we're in the works planning um, kind of a speaker matching series where if there are speakers in your area who are kind of um, leaders, thought leaders in the radical exchange movement, you know, they can come to your campus and speak. And we've had a, a couple examples of this so far, um, but looking to expand potentially regional connections, um, because that might be easier on the ground than you know over technology. Uh, yeah, I agree with what guys said that it's uh, it's really useful to co uh, coordinate with local groups. For example, uh, uh, recently there was established crypto economics research group in Russia, and uh, so I just introduced uh, radical markets ideas to its organizer, and uh, he invited me to participate in meetup. Uh, and, uh, and and yeah, some people after that they started to. Uh, to get acquainted in deeper level at radical markets ideas. Uh, but again, I think it's uh, uh, like when we try to uh, present ideas to some local groups, we should uh, focus not just uh, on uh, these new ideas, but to focus, uh, focus on uh, problems which these group ha groups have. So like if we uh, like see that, uh, for example, there is a problem with uh, data, uh, uh, like this data, and we, and we we see that uh, concepts from radical markets they can help solve uh, solve this problem. Yeah, yeah we can. Uh, so there is a goal in conversation, and it uh, it will be much easier to present ideas to this group. And uh, yeah, so again, what I uh, what I want to mention that uh, like real world implement implementations which show uh, some much better results, like three, five x better. So I think that's the best way we can do to spread it, radical markets ideas. So I, I don't want to give everyone the wrong idea. We're talking about these challenges to scale, and it's really important, obviously, because to be effective, we want we want to have scale. But nevertheless, there's an incredible amount of momentum. As I mentioned, my very first experience, you know, setting up this meeting without promoting it and coming back and finding that 45 people had signed up over the weekend. And similarly, I used to kind of have onboarding telephone calls with everyone in North America and in Europe and elsewhere when they wanted to start one. And what's happened in the last two or three months is that people have become motivated just by seeing these things online or listening to Glenn talk somewhere or reading a book and have not even communicated at all and just gone and looked at people's meetups that already exist and just have gone off and started their own. So there is a huge upwelling of interest and support of people driving these new, these new groups. And, uh, and so the, the w it's, a, it's a, an embarrassment of riches in terms of um, eagerness and participation, and we're just trying to kind of harness that and have it move in the right direction. So we only have a few minutes left. Um, I wanted We wanted to open it up because if anyone here is interested in starting their own chapter, have any questions or have any comments, we'd love to hear from them. We have mics up here. Joe, I'm gonna point at you and call you to come up and uh, and comment or have any questions that, uh, because Joe, uh, who's, uh, who's gonna be come up to the mic here, would be on the on the panel with us if there were one more chair. But um, Joe has been doing some great work uh, in the Chicago area. And so Joe, do you have any comments that you wanna? One of the things I thought was pretty interesting or useful that came up was, you know, we started an Airtable with just like a little repository of the games and the experiments that we can do at meetups, so for example, the first Chicago one, uh, we we did this Rawls game. Actually, it's not the Rawls game. Glenn corrected us, actually. <laughs> he knew what, what it really was, but everybody picked out 
10 different characteristics of a person. And then we used regular voting and quadratic voting to go through how you would actually vote on different things, both as, and it made you think about yourself and the other person, but also it made you think about the mechanism. And there were more than, it was about half of them where they came out with a different result with a group of maybe 25, 30 people at the meetup. And everybody was engaged, everybody enjoyed this. So just like the cost monopoly, you know, one of the things that I think is important is that we can share like the, the iteration and the learning that is done from that. So like the shared data table or, you know, I, I use a conference call or webinar software that's real easy where you can say, we can say Wednesdays at this time, we're doing our thing. If somebody leads it, you know, you know, maybe you and I, Tom, could do one one week and somebody else leads it another week and people can raise their hand from the chat and talk in the chat room right next to it. And it's like 20 bucks a month, so I don't mind even paying for it, but it's like if people can raise their hand and ask to speak at different times, you would, we could have that community place where any week, that week that you happen to have a question, you know where you can go to just have a conversation. I think that's real important from the human element is that so those are my thoughts on things we could do. I just I just want to brief, briefly uh, riff on that because I think that the, that's a really Im important point. We have, you know, all of us here have lives and jobs. And so when we try to participate in these movements, we have to squeeze in time here and there. And so uh, what I tell people is there's just a ton of work to be done, but no one person has to do a ton of work. But we all have to contribute some and a little bit, and coordination is really key for that. And so as Joe says, not only do we want to have potentially some community-oriented, um, you know, like Airtable or databases or spreadsheets that allow us to coordinate well, but we can also pitch in individually to share that knowledge within the, the broader community. So even though, again, that we want to be sure that each group is independent and autonomous and that there is no stress on you have to do this or you have to do that, nevertheless, getting together and having that communication is going to be really, really, really important. And I especially think about that for on the student side. You've been doing that a lot more with the colleges. And also, as students graduate and disperse, there's a lot more opportunity to share that knowledge and to get people involved. Um, have you had any thoughts about what's going to happen when you graduate and when Jack graduates and you all spread out into the world, how you're going to apply this um, a after you leave the university? Um, we definitely have been thinking about that. I think radical exchange students, we, we've, you know, we debated with various names. Did we want to be radical youth? So we weren't just you know, talking about students, but young people in general. Um, and I think the idea is as long as you're learning, you're by definition a student. So we definitely want to continue being involved even after we graduate and passing the torch down to younger people who uh, are interested in the ideas and are not yet graduated. Um, so I think in that sense, because you have students graduating and moving on, you know, you're naturally expanding the network and that's a great transition from, you know, I'll be in the Princeton chapter this year, but maybe next year I'll be in a local chapter somewhere, you know, in the world. Um, and we've also really found that human element critical in developing out the student network. So as infrastructure grows, you know, we have um, been strategizing how we're going to have kind of monthly conference calls and other forms of information that are readily available to help guide people as they set up their own infrastructure and build from the ground up. Um, but we found that the fact that the network naturally expands and grows as people enter and graduate college is something we think will be really helpful in developing out a larger network. And, and Tom, in terms of how you see, you know, the, the local chapter, you know, growing over time and then um, having that, um, having what you learn within this diverse community that some of us don't necessarily have, how, spreading that out into the world. Do you see any, are there any kind of ideas that you have around the process for that and how you see things moving forward? I don't mean to put you on the spot, but I any ideas that you would have on that would be really interesting. I'm trying to make myself obsolete. <laughs> um, in, in terms of the leadership of, of that community, I think that, that I've wanted to pass into hands of people who it affects more strongly. Um, because again, I'm not representative. So my hope is to find people who benefit from the ideas 
and, and put it in their hands and like watch the magic, kind of. Um, for me, I, it's hard to predict what, what I will do for radical exchange going forward. I think that I have a unique perspective coming from Detroit um, and a lot of like diversity and inclusion, inclusion work, so I look forward to seeing what other chapters do in that space um, because Detroit is only one city out of many. So that's uh, just why, wait and see, I guess. Yeah, well, like, I would like to add that uh, I'm personally uh, going to be engaged in the uh, uh, radical markets uh, community. And but what's important is to try to make uh, like these movements uh, like more like starfish. So there is uh, no uh, no exact leader uh, which, uh, if it, uh, if this leader decides to do something else, everything will fall apart. So it's uh, like it's critical to try to engage uh, several other key people. So it uh, like movement will be much more. Uh, it will live for a longer time this way. We have a, another audience uh, comment or question. Yeah, um, thank you guys so much for sharing about what your respective chapter of Radical Exchange is doing. Um, I'm Christine, I'm a reporter for Coindesk, and I thought it was really interesting that uh, when you are doing community outreach, a lot of the reception and the kind of connections you guys are making are with crypto and blockchain um, projects or, or teams and even your respective backgrounds of what some of the projects you guys are working on outside of Radical Exchange is related to crypto and blockchain. So I wanted your guys' thoughts on why do you think it is that reception to crypto and blockchain communities is so strong with the Radical Exchange movement and also how you see that partnership and that um, connection further progressing down the road in practical ways and uh, maybe social ways, uh, yeah. So, so that's a, a big old question with uh, uh, two minutes left, but I'll I'll, I'll jump in. So, um, I I think that um, I think that the crypto community in general is much more open to new systems and much more open to uh, changing the mechanisms of how we approach the world in ways that uh, the general population is not. Although I do think that, um, again, like the, the diversity that we are looking to achieve is represented by cohorts um, of, of, you know, of people who are uh, underprivileged in this country and elsewhere who do in fact see as well that there are new mechanisms and new approaches that can be taken to problems and there is a natural, uh, a natural set of allies there because we within the crypto space are eager to use blockchain environments for experimentation. Within a blockchain, uh, a blockchain environment, you have a complete coherent economy, and so you can reproduce a lot of the things experimentally that would otherwise happen in a perhaps a damaging way out in the broader world. So we can fail with and fail quickly and destroy you know, a blockchain project, which is sad, but, but nevertheless, it doesn't affect the broader population. Whereas if we tried to focus on some of these things in kind of practical ways within a community and things went wrong, real humans would be hurt, and lots of them, um, and, and those who tend to be underprivileged anyway. So I think there's a natural um, uh, disposition towards this kind of experimentation within the, within the crypto and blockchain community, more blockchain than crypto, but I'm not gonna get into that. Um, and, and so um, I think that uh, we, there are natural allies with these underprivileged communities. We come from different places, but we all see that we wanna change the mechanisms the way they are. Um, so that's kind of the, the, the brief answer, and I'm not gonna continue, but I'm happy to talk to you later. Um, I'm gonna pass it off. Does anyone, anyone else have any comments on that, on that question? Different, different answer, different perspective. I don't come from um, kind of a blockchain crypto background. I come from much more of a public policy, a sociology background in my studies. Um, and I know given kind of the other student interest I've seen in radical exchange, that it seems a lot of the interest is kind of decentralization as a value, the fact that that's such a big part of the movement, really um, in that sense, you know, that value, Glenn, Vitalik, we're already connected to the crypto community. Um, but I see even more so, you know, the fact that we are making this much more interdisciplinary um, is an opportunity to bring kind of decentralization as a value to a broader populace and um, to bring into, you know, alternatively the kind of blockchain and crypto space, uh, people who didn't necessarily have their voices heard in that space previously. So 
bringing different stakeholders um, into their respective different communities um, and like areas of thought is one of the really powerful uh, opportunities I've seen creating a student network for radical exchange. Uh, yeah, I, I also have blockchain background, so I totally agree with what Josh said. So. Yeah, so um, I, I, Marina, thank you very much for that difference perspective. I think the decentralization side is something that was not stressed, that, that is that lots of people find very valuable. Um, the idea of solving problems without centralized power and uh, that has kind of uh, monopolistic or coercive impact on people is, is a big deal. So we're at the bottom of the hour and we'll leave it there. Please thank uh, the panelists here who've provided some great information. <laughs> All right, thank you so much. And, and as uh, Marina said, we are gonna hang out. So if you have any questions or wanna start something yourselves or wanna chat, please let us know. Thank you. <laughs>